Imam Muhammad Abdullahi to uh, say the opening prayer. to better understand each other, regardless of our race, color, or creed. In one way or another, we may all have been subjected or affected by religious intolerance and misunderstandings, Jews, Christians, Muslims, or other faiths. We are indeed honored to host this event at our center, and we especially thank the I Am Your Protector organization and the sponsors who made it possible. Together, we sincerely join an advocate, and I quote, the community of people who speak up and stand up for each other across religion, ethnicity, gender, beliefs, unquote. I hope that when we leave tonight, we leave with a sincere sense of tolerance, kindness, and compassion for one another. Let us continue to strengthen and end the divide over religion, prejudice, and bigotry, and continue to promote a genuine, peaceful, and forgiving future for us, our children, and the generations that are yet to come. I thank and sincerely appreciate the great team that put this event together. They're all around you. And on their behalf, and on behalf of the Muslim Community Center and our MCC community, I sincerely welcome you all. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. And with that, I'm going to the next part of our program, and I would like to introduce our next speaker, Sister Nazli Chaudhry. She is the current president of the I Am Your Protectors DC chapter, who is also a director of interfaith relations and community outreach of the Hunger Band Project. Sister Nazli contributed nationally and internationally 
to causes that promote peace, understanding, and respect. She is a graduate of the University of Calgary. She is known for her work in building interfaith relations in New York and now has continued in Maryland. She has been particularly active in engaging the Muslim American community with other faith-based communities in meaningful dialogue and community service, youth engagement, gender equity, and domestic violence education. A few of Sister Nazli's many accomplishments are she served on the Islamic Center of Long Island's Board of Trustees and was co-chair of the Domestic Harmony Foundation. She was the first director of the Interfaith Relations at the Suffolk, New York Jewish Community Center. In 2011, she was the first Muslim woman chaplain at New York Hofstra University. She diligently works to promote peaceful coexistence among different faiths and is truly a force to reckon with for the uh, her outstanding community service. Ladies and gentlemen, Sister Nazli Chowdhury. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome everyone, salam, shalom, and good evening. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight to honor courageous protectors and heroes. Um, none of this would have been possible without an outstanding team of I Am Your Protector volunteers, and I will name them Danny, Myra, Reham, Wardha, and the amazing uh, people at the Muslim Community Center, or I'm going to use MCC, um, and especially Brother Samir Jaffrey, who's the chair of the Interfaith committee and uh, Sister Lubna Jaz, whom you just heard from, she's the president of MCC. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, when I first had the idea to uh, host the Holocaust Memorial Day at a mosque, I reached out to um, several area mosques and um, I immediately got response from three, three mosques and MCC was one of the, the mosques that responded immediately and enthusiastically agreed to host the event and we thank you so much for for making this happen um, unfortunately our event was had to be postponed on january 27 because of the colossal snow, snow <laughs> snowstorm we had so but um a couple of months later he, uh, very, we're really proud to actually make it happen so i am your protector is a community of people who speak up and stand up for each other across religion, race, gender, and beliefs. From bullying to genocide and everything in between, we can either be silent and look the other way, or we can speak up and stand up for one another. Today, we are honoring the protectors who saved the people from persecution during the Holocaust. Their remarkable and brave behavior is a light and inspiration for humanity. It is our responsibility, it is our duty to stand up for each other as protectors. Hatred becomes legitimate and acceptable when a group is dehumanized and otherized, and when it is perceived as a threat. The common denominator of war, conflict, and genocide is that at one moment or another, there are narratives that lead masses to believe that they are under threat, whether it is true or not, and that they have to protect and defend themselves. Fear is a powerful emotion which can drive people to commit atrocities. But so is compassion and empathy, which can inspire people to be the best of humanity. I Am Your Protector is that compassionate community, united by a shared value that we are each other's protector, that we are one human family, that we must learn to rethink that our empathy transcends blood ties, tribes, gender, nationality, religions, and ideological bonds. We are guided and inspired by the words of Einstein who said, the world will not be destroyed by people who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. I Am Your Protector held events in New York, Geneva, Albania, and Lahore to commemorate Holocaust Memorial Day on January 27th this year, and the DC event is being held today. The President of the, and the people of Albania were honored for their outstanding moral code called the BESA, some of you may have heard that, 
um, in a New York synagogue with 800 people in attendance. Albania, a Muslim-majority country, was the only country in the world whose Jewish population increased during the uh, Second World War, as the Bessa Code called upon it to protect the stranger, a message and model that inspires I am your protector. The commemoration in New York was led by Imam Khaled Latif and Rabbi Yehuda Sarna, who shared the story of his wife's family who was saved during the Holocaust by an Egyptian Muslim uh, doctor who, and who shared the importance of being each other's protector um, in these times of rising hatred. The I Am Your Protector commemoration in Albania featured Prince Lika Zugu uh, II, grandson of King Zog I, who saved thousands of Jews during the Holocaust. I Am Your Protector just launched a chapter in Pakistan and held a very successful commemoration in Lahore. Incredible stories were shared about different communities standing up for each other, in particular about uh, stories about Jews who were saved by Pakistani families. Tonight you will hear from a rabbi, a reverend, and an imam about their religious perspectives on the concept of protecting the other. We are honored to have with us Joanna Newman, or she will be joining us shortly, a Holocaust survivor who was saved by Albanian Muslims. We will conclude our program by reading the testimonies of protectors and then have a candle lighting ceremony. We hope that you will find our program meaningful and inspirational. And um, if Mara is here, I would call her to come up and introduce our next speaker. I think she's just coming in. Um, and thanks once again for, for all coming. Thank you. to introduce tonight Rabbi Batya Steinloff. Um, Rabbi Batya Steinloff works at the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington uh, as the Director of Social Justice and Interfaith Initiatives. She is a conservative rabbi that was ordained by the Jewish Theological Seminary and is involved in multiple projects uh, for social justice and awareness. She is the chair of the Interfaith Conference of Metropolitan Washington and is the co-chair of the Montgomery County Executive's Faith Community Advisory Working Group. So join me in welcoming our rabbi. Thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm so honored to be here. Oh, is that better? Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and so honored, so thank you. We learn in the Torah that God formed the first human being from the earth itself and breathed into that human being the breath of life. Each and every one of us breathes with the breath of the divine. That should be enough for us to know how much we need to value every single human being. But just in case, it's mentioned again and again that we are responsible for every human being, and particularly for the vulnerable. We learn in the part of the book of Leviticus called the Holiness Code that we are supposed to be holy and the answer, the reason, again and again, is because I am the Lord your God. Right? You will not stand idly by the blood of your fellow. Right? Each and every one of us is responsible for the life of each and every one of us. It doesn't matter if it costs you money. It doesn't matter if it even endangers your own life. It doesn't even matter if it's not that dangerous. We are responsible for one another. Over and over again, Ger Yatom and Almana, the stranger, the, visit, the visitor who has no one to protect that person, and the orphan and the widow, the most vulnerable people in society, we must protect them again and again, just in case we might forget. 
because God is God. We always remember that if you save one life, and, we, and Mama Hobbit stole my quote, right? Um, <laughs> if you save one life, you have saved an entire world. And that responsibility is one we must take very seriously. And I am honored to be here to honor someone who remembered to care for another human being. Thank you. I have the honor to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Carol, Reverend Dr. Carol F. Flett. I'm having trouble. You did good. You did good. You did good. Keep going. I need your support in your mind. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Carol Flett is the educational and interreligious officer of the Episcopalian Diocese of Washington. I think Imam Jari should have been doing this. She has served as a parish priest for over 25 years and she has focused on congregational development and anti-racism education. For a long time now, Reverend Carol Flett has been actively engaged in developing interfaith dialogues. She has served as the chair of the board of the Interfaith Conference of Washington, D.C., and is now co-chair of the Montgomery County Faith Community Working Group and chair of the Faith Leaders Response Team. She has led many other interfaith groups and efforts, list is too long, and continues to coordinate two women's interfaith groups in this area. I think it's high time that she does a little coordination for men also. <laughs> <laughs> My honor to present Dr. Carol Flett. Thank you very much. And again, a thank you for inviting me to be a part of this meaningful and quite remarkable evening that we're having together. Um, to respond to your last comment, I wish the men would create some of your favorites. <laughs> but women seem to do this somehow more naturally. I have 30 women in one group and 30 women in another, and we meet monthly, and it's all mixed up. We have Sikhs and Hindus and Buddhists and Baha'is and Jews and Christians and Muslims. And uh, we don't just talk about our similarities, we also recognize some of the meaningful differences. So it's a very important gathering. Um, I want to sort of give some examples of, of why Christians feel we need to stand up um, and advocate or protect um, the other. Um, our first example is Jesus of Nazareth. When Jesus was beginning his ministry, he was trying to call and create a radical new family not based on blood relationship, but on the human, divine, ethical relationship. And in the Gospel of Mark, as he was gathering around a crowd of people, he looked around and he said, and looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. And that's a wonderful foundation for how we look upon our neighbors. So this was a deciding factor in how to develop a Christian community, because Jesus was a friend to those who were considered other by the Jewish tradition in his day. Non-Jews, those who were considered ritually unclean. Jesus often offered a friendship with those who were considered unlovable by eating and drinking with prostitutes and those who were sort of on the margins of their culture and society. And his table fellowship with those who were other was the demonstration of what the, the great banquet in heaven would be like. And his, his hope was to create a community of all people. And so the Christian church has carried that forward 
and that the local church bases its views, its values, and its mission on this, this mandate to be a house of prayer for all people, which we took from Isaiah, so that we would welcome anyone. The, the cathedral in Washington is an example of that. It's a giant sign in there saying, you are, this is a house of prayer for all people. Because so everyone, is, everyone is welcome. And, it, and when we become Christians, we make promises at our baptism, which is similar to the use of water in all of our traditions. Um, people are, we, we, we're very neat. We don't immerse people. We sprinkle water on them. You know. um, we often call sprinkle Christians because we sprinkle water, we sprinkle rice, and we sprinkle dirt. <laughs> we don't get ourselves too messy. <laughs> but when we are baptized, we promise that we will seek and serve the image of God in all persons. We're in, in told to look into the eyes of those that we know and, and strangers and to see the image of God in that person's face and eyes. And then we're also promised that we will seek justice and peace among all people. And lastly, we promise to respect the dignity of every human being. So those are promises that we make at our baptism. And we renew those promises every time we're a witness to another person's baptism. So those promises are renewed several times a year in our Sunday worship services. So Jesus of Nazareth is a huge example for us of how to stand up and advocate um, for the other. The other person, which I'm hoping most of you already know about, is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He is certainly someone that the Christians lift up as a, as a model for us to follow. Bonhoeffer was a German Lutheran pastor, theologian, and anti-Nazi dissident um, during World War II. And during his ministry, he did all kinds of advocating and, and even developed a plan to um, eliminate uh, Adolf Hitler. So he and some others were arrested and um, taken to concentration camps, and he was executed in the concentration camp. It was interesting, God works in mysterious ways. He was, he was executed on Good Friday. Mm. I don't know if the Nazis realized that, but they probably did. But he was then lifted up as a Christian model of willing to sacrifice your life for the sake of others. And so Bonhoeffer continues to be someone that we recognize on our calendar. We have a number of heroes and saints that we recognize, and, and Bonhoeffer is on that list. And so he is someone that we, we, we try to emulate. Um, and I think also my own life, I have, uh, I'm a child of the 60s, so my first other that I've advocated for were African Americans. And so I got my doctoral ministry on anti-racism education. And that was in like the late 90s. Um, and never realizing that how much that education about anti-racism education would just apply so naturally to interfaith relations. Because the same kinds of ground rules and understanding in anti-racism education apply to interfaith relations. And so again, we learn to stand up for those who are perceived by others to be different. But we see them as members of our family because we're all, as Matcha said, we're all children of God. Thank you. Uh, uh, Imam uh, Wangari is a director of the outreach of our outreach at the Al Hijra Islamic Center. Uh, he was uh, he was a before that when he was a, he was president of the Muslim Student Association at Howard University and later became a Muslim chaplain at Howard University. Uh, he was the first Muslim officially installed as a chaplain in higher education and is the head of the National Association of Muslim Chaplains in Higher Education. The Imam also serves as a, as a chair of the government relations for the Muslim Alliance of North America. He is director of the community outreach for uh, the Al-Hijra Islamic Center and president of the Muslim Society of Washington. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> and, and I used to be Episcopal. Uh, uh, I, I can actually say that I'm probably a better Episcopalian now than I was then. <laughs> Trying to figure that out. We're friends. Yeah, yeah, we will. <laughs> First, I just really want to um, thank you all for organizing this event. Uh, and before I begin my uh, my formal comments, I just want to share something. Um, a couple of years ago, at the UN General Assembly, I had the opportunity, along with many other American Muslim leaders,
to have dinner with Ahmadinejad. And I shared in the meeting uh, with uh, President Dinejad that because he is a leader, that when he speaks, people listen. And that his discourse about the denial of the Holocaust is not helping us. That Muslims in America, that by the way, this is in front of everybody. Muslims in America believe that the Holocaust happened. And that his objective of trying to raise the issue of the Palestinian people is obscured by his denial of the Holocaust. Right? So uh, it is a, a modern day remembrance of Holocaust deniers. Um, it's hard to think that any intelligent person could still be in denial, but I, I think they still are some. Dr. King said we are caught in a network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny, that whatever affects one directly affects all of us indirectly, that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The Quran reminds us that the way that, that the Almighty has ordered civilization that were it not for one group of people who would stand up and challenge others, the whole world would be covered in corruption. And therefore, it's incumbent upon us that we stand up for justice. Our current political context reminds us of the importance of standing for justice. And it is particularly clear that we have an opportunity as people today, right now, to enjoin what is right, as the Quran says, and to forbid what is wrong. I'm reminded of Pastor uh, Martin Niemöller, who often uh, people uh, give his quote to Bonhoeffer. He said, they came for the socialists, but I wasn't a socialist. And so I didn't speak out. And they came for the trade unionists, and I wasn't a trade unionist, so I didn't speak up. And then they came for the Jews, and I wasn't a Jew, so I didn't speak up. And when they came for me, there was no one left to speak up. The reality is that we live in a world where the, the speech itself, the ability to stand in the face of tyranny, some would call it in the Quran a form of jihad. Am I right, Imam? Striving for what is just. And so within that framework, the Quran has reminded us that even if a person who rejects Islam, they reject Judaism, they reject Christianity. But if they are in need of refuge, that you as a believer have a religious obligation to give them refuge. And so I'm reminded today about the courageous Muslims in Albania, the only majority Muslim country in Europe who safeguarded the lives of Jews to the degree that when the Nazis in 1943 ordered the Albanian authorities to give them the census data on Jews in their country, they refused. Now I want you to know this is, a, this is an act of, of civil disobedience. And they did it. And so we have an obligation today not only to remember, but to continue and to recommit ourselves. Some of us need to remember, some of us need to recommit ourselves to standing for justice right now. Uh, I don't believe there's been a time in my lifetime where there's been war on so many continents, all at the same time. So it's not surprising that the, the discourse that we're having now is a discourse of intolerance. And as intolerance on the right, you know what I'm talking about. Or you can talk about ISIS and Al-Qaeda or the other ones, that the reality is that right now the world is caught in this cycle of violence and intolerance. You and I need a movement 
an interfaith movement, an international movement to stand for justice and to establish peace. Thank you. and peace be upon you all. Thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Reham Osman and I work with the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Um, we're a public policy organization. We're based not too far away in Washington, D.C. and we engage with media, government, and Hollywood to improve perceptions of American Muslims and to get Muslims more involved in these areas. Um, so tonight I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, our keynote speaker. Ms. Joanna Newman. I would now like to ask Ms. Joanna to come up and to tell her story. It's a very powerful story, and I'm really looking forward to hearing her tell it. We chatted a little bit in the car, um, so I know personally it's very powerful, and I'm sure you all will be able to really connect to her tonight. So please welcome her to the stage. to this group. I have spoken before at the mosque in Sterling, Virginia, which was quite an honor, and I've met the imam there, and uh, have met him subsequently in several places. A wonderful group of people. My story is, unfor is fortunately a very happy one. Happy in the sense that when you talk about the Holocaust, it is not what you usually hear. I just met this week at the Holocaust Museum with 50 students from a Hebrew day school. They went through the museum. It's the uh, Berman School or the Hebrew Academy. And of course, very, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously a very um, sad day for them. I met with them at the end of the day, and I told them that what they will hear from me maybe will help them a little bit to overcome what they had just seen of all the horror and tragedy. So here's my story. I was born in Germany, in Hamburg, where my mother's family had lived for no less than 300 years. My father was born in Germany. My father had fought for Germany, for the German Kaiser. He had been an officer. Thank you. Um, they were German Jews. Hitler came to power and all of a sudden everything changed very, very quickly. 1933, first the judges could no longer be judges, the lawyers could no longer serve anyone but Jewish clients, doctors were not allowed to treat anyone but Jewish uh, patients, etc., etc. As a child of seven, eight years old, I could no longer go to a playground, I couldn't go to a movie house, I couldn't go to a theater, I couldn't go to the beach. Wherever you went, there were signs up, Jews not wanted. Mm. 1938, November 10th, 9th to the 10th, most people call it Kristallnacht, or the night of broken glass, or like one of my German friends says, crystal is something beautiful, he would never call it crystal night. He would only call it the November program. 
spontaneously, or not so spontaneously, of, as we well know, every synagogue in Austria and in Germany was attacked. In many cases, burned down. In many cases, damaged fairly badly. The holy books, the Torah scrolls, thrown into the street, torn up, and so on. Well, my parents realized there was no longer any place for Jews in Germany. And they had the good fortune to have heard that there was a country called Albania. Now, many of you know about the Balkans, and there are a few larger countries in the Balkans, but Albania is definitely the smallest. However, the only Muslim monarch of all of Europe, King Zog, had given orders to allow every Jew who wanted to come into the country to be given a visa, no questions asked, just come. You're welcome. My parents got visas, we packed up, and we went to Albania in March of 1939. Not knowing what to expect, not knowing what the country looked like, not knowing anything. At the time, Albania had a population of maybe a little over a million citizens. The majority, to be correct, 85% were Muslims, observant Muslims. They welcomed us with open arms. We were not refugees. In their eyes, we were guests who needed help. And according to the moral court of Albania, called Bessa, which means a promise, the stranger in my house, which extends to the stranger in my country, has to be protected, no matter what. We immediately had Albanian friends. We moved around a great deal for one reason or another. And as it turned out, I once made the account, we moved 16 times. And somehow or other, always lived in homes of Muslims. We were in a small town called Berat, which is in the center of Albania, and that was during the Italian-Greek War. We had to go there because, not because we were Jews, by the way, Italy occupied Albania in 1939. They left us in peace. They, the Italians did not um, you know, uh, persecute Jews the way they, the Germans did. They knew we were Jews. They left us alone. But because where we lived in Duras is a port city, and foreigners really were not allowed in a port city. So we had to go to Berat. We lived in the home of a wonderful, wonderful Albanian Muslim family. I'm saying wonderful because I think among all the families we met, maybe they were the most observant. It was, for my father in particular, such an eye-opener, something so unusual. Came Ramadan, and then came Bayram, or you call it El Fitra, I think. And the first thing was that in the morning, somebody came and dug some holes in the ground. They slaughtered a few sheep, they cut it up, and in each hole they put parts of this animal. No one was there. They opened the gate and poor people came in and took just what they needed. Either they needed the skin to make a warm coat for themselves or their children, or they needed the meat, whatever, not more and not less, and nobody was there to tell them what to take or what not to take. <clears throat> we were wined and dined with kadaif, baklava, everything you can imagine. 
and we were invited to join them in the mosque, and we went with them to the mosque. It was really a most delightful, interesting, educational experience. We then moved again back into the port city of Douglas and lived again a family that was very observant. We woke up at five o'clock every morning when they ate before starting the fast of Ramadan. And this is when the Germans finally occupied Albania. Now, I have to come back to 1942, first of all. Germany occupied the former Yugoslavia. The Albanian government opened the border and allowed as many Jews as possible to cross the border. The exact figures are not known. It's assumed that it was several thousand, probably 2,000, maybe 2,500. We're not sure. But however it was, they were saved. The German general in Belgrade knew exactly who had escaped and demanded that they be returned within 48 hours. He approached the interior minister, Mr. Kruja, to return all of the escaped Jews. Oh yes, of course, we will find them. Yeah, we will return them. Mr. Kruja took all of them and distributed them among the peasants, among the farmers, among farm families. And in the end, those that he couldn't find enough places for quickly enough, put them into a hospital and claimed that the hospital was under quarantine for typhoid fever. And I think everybody knows how dangerous typhoid fever is. <laughs> Went back to the Germans and said, Sorry, we looked for Jews, but we don't know any Jews. We only know Albanians. Now I have to tell you, the courage, the incredible courage of these people cannot be overestimated. The brutality with which Nazi Germany ruled is well known. They could have killed every last person. If they had discovered that they were hiding Jews, my God, the whole family would have been killed. My mother had met in Duras a family by the name of Pilku. Mr. Pilku had studied in Germany, engineering, met his wife there, a German, married her. I believe that she had converted to Islam because she observed everything. And we became very close friends with them. The Germans occupied Albania, and of course it was known that there was a nice German lady that had to be visited. Well, they came every day. This woman had the courage. Now, I can't even begin to tell you what that means. To introduce my mother as a relative from Germany who was visiting. Now, anybody, anybody could have said, see this person over there? That's Jewish. We all would have been killed on the spot. Indeed, one of these wonderful German officers who came to visit and spoke with my mother said to her, if a Jew or a communist would come near me, I would shoot him on the spot. To this day, I cannot believe how my mother kept her cool. It went very, it became very, very dangerous and very, very difficult. Yes, indeed, the, Ger the Germans in Albania demanded the list of the Jews. This was the first thing they did in every country. The Albanian government said, we don't know any Jews, we only know Albanians. And again, they showed an incredible, incredible courage. I have even proof of this. 
a gentleman, an Albanian um, historian, wrote a history book a few years ago, and he sent it to me. Unfortunately, I no longer speak Albanian, and I can't read it, of course. However, I went through the book, page by page, and there, on one page, he had reproduced a German document written by von Tatten and Miller. Von Tatten was the chief SS officer in Tirana, in the capital, and the other one was his uh, right-hand man or whatever. And the document said as follows, in German, to the foreign ministry in Berlin, we know what you want us to do, we do not consider it the right time at the moment to do it. The Albanian government will not cooperate with us. We will have to wait until our position becomes stronger in this country and we will have more military support. At the moment, we cannot do it. Oh, really? You forget, figured it out, huh? That the Albanians wouldn't... Oh, and, and there was another sentence in there, actually, which said, we cannot do it as you wish without the knowledge of the Albanians. They wouldn't let us do it. Very interesting. Had more countries had this kind of stamina, of this kind of courage, many more Jews would have survived. However, when you do go to the Holocaust Museum or many other places where you can see the lists of the righteous among the nations. And by the way, I want to point out that among the one million Albanians, the righteous among the nations are 75 families, which is a pretty high percentage. But you will see, and I'm surprised myself and I see it, there are many names of Germans, there are many names of Polish people, there are many names of many other countries, and of course we do know that Denmark helped very much by smuggling Jews from Denmark on fishing boats over to Sweden, etc. But they did it also with a tremendous amount of danger because Albania was the only country where the government cooperated with the civilian population in other countries, maybe not in Denmark, I don't want to say that at all, but in other countries, certainly in Germany and certainly in Poland, they had to fear to be denounced by their own friends and their own neighbors. The situation was something unbelievable. To point out, I believe, what these gentlemen were saying, if you are prejudiced against one group of people, you are prejudiced against every minority group of people. You can't single them out. Why would you be against Jews? Why would you be against Muslims? Why would you be against Christians? And by the way, the 15% of Christians who lived in Albania, Greek Orthodox and some Catholics, also helped. There were some of our people who were hidden in their homes. I was mentioning in the car when we came here, I did go to a um, Italian school that was taught by nuns, and there were some Muslim children. So the Muslim children and this one Jewish kid were allowed to remain seated while the Christian children were saying their morning prayers. At any rate, what the Albanian people did, there are not enough words of praise, of thanks, etc. I was invited back to Albania uh, with my husband and my daughter, and um, I was honored by them. Why? Because I wrote a book, and that was the first book that anybody had written about their life in Albania and how the Albanian people had received us. As I said, we were friends. We were treated as friends. We were not refugees, we were not foreigners. 
We needed help and they gave us help. Um, on the, uh, before I come to this, another interesting story is we were living in another little city in the home of a police officer, a Muslim police officer. Okay. It was our Passover holiday. And the gentleman asked my father whether he would allow him to sit with us and participate in the Seda ceremony. I can't exactly tell you how my father was this broken Italian, certainly not Albanian, <laughs> and maybe some English and German, I'm not sure, was able to explain the exodus from Egypt but it worked. The man sat through two evenings of the Seder with us. <laughs> Many years later, this was 1942. In 1945, 44, end of 44, the partisans occupied Albania and the Germans disappeared. And there was for 18 days fighting in the city of in the capital city of Tirana. And my parents had taken me to a family, one of our immigrant families, who lived a little bit outside of the city. They had gone back to our uh, room to pick up a few personal items. And on the way back, shooting started. And my father in German, of course, said to my mother, she should lie flat on the ground. And a partisan woman soldier heard him speak German. And of course, she thought, ah, I caught some good German spies. So she arrested them on the spot, took them to the nearest military station. And lo and behold, God was very good to us. Believe me, God was very good to us. The police officer who spent two nights of the sailor with us was in charge. <laughs> he gave them the, 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 the customary hug and kiss, gave them a, a soldier and said, don't move again. Next time I may not be around. <laughs> Stay where you are till this is finished. At any rate, um, it, it uh, it was a very interesting, very interesting experience. Now, what I was going to tell you was, and this is very, uh, to me, an unbelievable uh, uh, incident. We were invited back, as I said, we, I was being honored, which was lovely, very nice. In City Hall, in Dulles, which is the, the uh, port city, and as I was coming out of the, um, limousine that was driving us there. It's in the center of the city. Visualize that here is the city hall. <coughs> and across the street is the largest, most beautiful mosque. I've been in it. It's a very beautiful mosque. As I got out of the limousine, the city band came along and they played the Star Spangled Banner. Mm -hmm. And immediately followed by the Hatikva. And at that very moment, the Moazit called the faithful to prayer. That combination was so unbelievable. I was unable to move. I was unable to move. All I could think is, if this can happen here, why can't we all live in peace together? You may ask me questions, please do. But I'd like to finish on the note of saying that our Talmud teaches us, he who saves one life is as though he saves the world. I'm here, I'm telling you this wonderful story about the wonderful Albanian people. We have four children, we have 14 grandchildren, and we have 16 and a half great-grandchildren. <laughs> and that would not have happened if it hadn't been for the Albanian people. Thank you very much.
second. I uh, am in touch with, there are two organizations that I do want to mention to you. One is called the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom. They have now 19 chapters throughout the United States. It's a lady who started it. She started it with members of her congregation. And the members of the congregation approached the local mosque. So they had 40 Jewish women and 40 Muslim women. And together, they have created 19 chapters. This last winter, now in January, they took a trip to Bosnia and Albania, and they called it Building Bridges. It's a fantastic organization, and they are very, very successful, and they're doing everything to build bridges. Now, the other thing is, in Israel, in Israel is a young man, his name is Yehuda Stalov. And he started a good number of years ago an interface organization, which by now has a total of 61 groups throughout Israel, including places like Hebron and other uh, danger spots, let's say, or, 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 or sensitive spots, okay? They meet regularly. On Tuesday, January 12th, the Interface Encounter Association participates with its executive director and 10 of its coordinators in a round table organized by the Interparliamentary Coalition of Global Ethics, al Sadiqman and movements for the culture of peace and reconciliation. Rabbi Benjamin Abramson, founder director Azad Dikin, Iman Mohammed Assisi, vice president, French Association of Muslim Jewish Friendship, etc., etc., there's a whole long list there. Uh, Drusim as well for the culture of peace and social justice. And that's happening as well in Israel. Unfortunately, and whoever would like to read this in Arabic or in Hebrew can, because this is, comes always in English, Arabic, and Hebrew. Um, <coughs> unfortunately, we only hear the bad things. We only hear the sensational things that get into the press. That's human nature. There is a lot of good things going on. And we all should join and do our <coughs> utmost to promote this and to let it grow. What about you, Joanna? Um, I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions. Yes, by all means, please do. Um, we're, we're just completely honored and, and to have you. You're such a blessing, and, and thank, you, pleasure, thank you so much. Um, if there are any questions, I'm going to bring the mic around, and Joanna, you can answer. And you might have to leave. <laughs> thank you very much. I think it's very enlightening, your talk. Thank you. Um, you mentioned about Bosnia. In British Bosnia, you mentioned about you and what, and I think it's probably lesser known that the second country in Europe where the significant population is Muslim and did also very, many good things during that time. The Bosnian Muslims also sheltered many Jewish families, and I understand Israel has honored some of these yes, Bosnians, they are their descendants. Thank you. I think it's the rabbi behind you. Hi, Dan Spiro. I coordinate the Jewish Islamic Dialogue Society in Washington. If you live in this area, you must join us. Um, I'm also a child of the Holocaust, but unfortunately my family didn't fare so well. So I'm, I'm thrilled to hear your story. Thank you. 
um, but I, I have to say this. Uh, so we often hear a challenge in, uh, in our synagogues. Why don't the Muslims say more to speak out against violence and injustice? Tonight, I have heard something said that moves me to try to model what we ask the Muslims to do. Okay? Three times tonight, maybe four, we heard the statement, a person who saves a life is like saving the whole world. Well, I won't throw the person's name under the bus, although I know you're familiar with this, this person's synagogue. But um, among, when we've been involved in Jewish-Islamic dialogue, we've been hearing from Jews who come from the Orthodox community. And we've been hearing about a very disturbing trend that increasingly people are taught, he who saves a Jewish life is like saving the whole world. You say no? Well, but I don't know how, whether you're Orthodox. But this is something that is being taught more and more among our people. And I have to witness to this and say how disturbing that is and how the movement that my brother mentioned, or excuse me, as we say in Jids, our co my cousin mentioned, um, this has to be a movement. Interfaith has to be a movement. And we have to fight trends like this because that statement is anathema to everything I was taught as a Jew. I have to honestly say that I've never, ever heard that. Never. And I did not hear it when I was growing up and when I was at a yeshiva. This is a recent trend. Terrible. Absolutely terrible. Absolutely terrible. We'll take one more question. We're running out of time. Sir. Very short one. Okay. Yes. A question. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Tell us about your book. Is it available? And what is its name? And I would love to read it. I'm happy to tell you that it, yes, is available on Amazon. Some gentleman who happened to see it called me and said, did you know you can publish it at Amazon? And I did not know. So like about four months ago, he asked my permission whether he could do it, and he did it. It's called Escape to Albania. <laughs> and it's on, the, on, on Amazon. Right. I, I, have, I have to say one more thing. Okay. It was for the longest time the only book about, uh, about Albania. <laughs> okay, this will be our last question. I want to introduce you to somebody whose family is a Muslim. He's a Muslim and his family is from Albania. From Albania. Colin Christopher, if you stand up. Okay. I just wanted to thank you for sharing your story. Um, I visited Albania for the first time 10 years ago. And I experienced, I, I don't speak Albanian, but you know, obviously my, my, my grandparents came over uh, in the 1930s from Albania. And I was welcomed like you, under much happier circumstances. Um, and I, I think that it, it, it shows the humanity that, that exists in the world that really, that the light shines much stronger than the darkness. Mm -hmm. And I think that your story captures that essence. And there's no time better to share this story than today. Today, like literally today. <laughs> um, and so I just want to thank you for, for your courage as well. Do you still have family in Albania? I'm sorry. Do you have family in Albania? Yeah, all over. Where? All over. All over. I see. Well, when I was back in Albania in, I think it was 09, but I'm not sure. It could have been less, uh, more recent than that. I still met with the son of the Pilko family. He has meanwhile passed away, unfortunately. And I was, you know, we were both born in the same year. We played in the sand together, and here we were two old people. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun because he told me I made the best sand balls when he had a fight with his friend. <laughs> so that was fun too. Um, we're absolutely grateful and thankful for you to join us today. We actually um, 
forgoed our um, reading of the testimonies because um, I, I didn't want to interrupt Joanna. She, she was sharing such pearls of wisdom with us. And um, so if somebody, uh, anyone wants to read the testimonies of the protectors, we're going to put up posters in the back. And, um, and, and you can read the stories yourself. I'm going to invite uh, Brother um, Zafar Mirza to come up and uh, just close our program. To get, and again, once again, thank you everyone for, for coming tonight. snacks left over and also the restrooms are downstairs if you uh, for those of you who need to use them so you have to go up no downstairs you have to take the stairs down and yeah so. Yes, but it is a regular fear of politics. Yeah. 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 Yeah